In view of the escalation of international sanctions, the Russian Federation announced that they plan to reciprocate and evaluate bilateral relations with those countries imposing measures on them. The highest authorities of the armed forces of Honduras held a ceremony to transfer their command to President Xiomara Castro, which makes her the general commander of the armed institution. Thousands of sheets from across Iraq gather in Baghdad on Saturday to mark the death of the 8th century Imam Musa al Qadim. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Now we begin with the news. In view of the escalation of international sanctions, the Russian Federation announced that they plan to reciprocate and evaluate bilateral relations with those countries, imposing measures on them. The Security Council's Vice President Dmitry Medvedev warned that sanctions against his country are an excellent occasion to review bilateral relations and open the possibility of interrupting the dialogue on strategic stability. For its part, the Federal Air Transport Agency announced that since European countries closed on Saturday the past flights coming from Russia, reciprocal measures will be taken and Russian airspace will be closed to them. Thus, only flights with special permission from the Federal Agency or the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be allowed to fly over their airspace. And Russia claims 16 Ukrainian Navy gunboats attacked Russian Black Sea fleet ships on Friday night as they were transporting 82 Ukrainian servicemen who surrendered as Snake Island off the northern Black Sea coast. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the Ukrainian gunboats uh, used swarming tactics in retaliation for the surrender of Ukrainian troops so they could to be able to accuse the Russian army of the massacre of prisoners. According to a source, as a result of the naval clash, six boats were destroyed. None of the 82 Ukrainian servicemen on the Snake Islands was wounded. On the other side, the Ukrainian president said that all men had died and promised to award them as heroes of Ukraine posthumously. Yet, Moscow assured that after fulfilling the legal procedures, these soldiers will be released to the return to their families. The Russian government announced that it expects to resume negotiations with Kyiv in the coming hours on the third day of the special military operation on Ukrainian territory. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova said the Ukrainian authorities proposed to Russia to talk on Saturday about a possible negotiation between the parties after refusing to move forward on the issue on Friday. In the same line, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said Ukraine avoided sitting down a negotiating table after Moscow accepted Kyiv's proposal and suggested Minsk, the capital of Belarus, as the venue for the talks. Peskov also declared Ukraine proposed Warsaw, the capital of Poland, as alternative venue for the dialogue and then broke off communication. Meanwhile, the Russian armed forces have disabled 821 military targets in Ukraine since the beginning of the special operation. The spokesperson of the Russian Ministry of Defense, Igor Konashenkov, specified that 14 air bases, 19 command centers, 24 anti-aircraft missile systems and 48 radar stations were destroyed. In addition, seven fighter planes, seven helicopters and nine drones were shot down, while 87 tanks and other armored combat vehicles were hit. The Russian Defense Ministry also assured that the military attacks are not directed against Ukrainian cities and neither endanger the civilian population. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky decried any intention of laying down the arms. On the contrary, he was emphatic about the resolve to continue fighting to defend their territory. Good morning to all Ukrainians. There is a lot of false information on the internet, a false call on the part to soldiers to lay down their weapons, saying there is an ongoing massive evacuation. The situation is this, I'm here and we are not laying down our arms. We will defend our country because our weapons are our troops. Our truth is that is our land, our country, our sons and daughters, and we will defend all of this. That's all I want to say. Glory to Ukraine. 
For his part, Mikhail Poroliak, advisor to the president of Ukraine, said that Kyiv has managed to fight off the attacks in the capital and in the south of the country. According to Poroliak, the main fighting is taking place in Kherson, Miklaiv, Odessa and Maripol, cities located in the south and the country and stated that in these places the defense is being conducted successfully. He also pointed out that they understand Kyiv is Moscow's main target, although he noted that no significant advances are being reported from Russian forces. In this regard, President Zelensky's advisor pointed out that Moscow's global is the goal is the destruction of the political leadership of the country. Kyiv is the top priority target now, as we understand it. The main goal of this Russian special operation is the destruction of Ukrainian military and political leadership. Russian space agency Roscosmos has suspended cooperation with its European partners in organizing joint space launches from the Kourou port in the French Guiana. Roscosmos Director General Dmitry Rogozin said the decision to halt joint launches spawns from the economic and technological sanctions imposed on Russia by the European Union, which hindered the normal development agreed upon to keep the facility running properly. Furthermore, he said some 87 Russian citizens will be sent back to Russia. These are mostly personnel specialized in fregat launch technology, which allows the orbital launch of supplies for the International Space Station. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. On Friday, the highest authorities of the armed forces of Honduras held a ceremony to transfer their command to President Xiomara Castro, which made her the general commander of the army institution. During the ceremony at the Campo Parada Marte in Tegucigalpa, Castro carried out a tour accompanied by the Minister of Defense, Jose Manuel Zelaya, and greeted the troops that make up the country's armed forces. Rear Admiral and Chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Jose Marfortin Aguilar, performed the honors of ordinance and handed the baton of command to the Honduran ruler. The President announced that as of February 28th, she will gradually begin the process of removing the armed forces from the administration and custody of the country's penitentiary system. At the same time, this, she stressed that they will continue to support the work of national police in its mission to guarantee public security. The government of the Dominican Republic began the construction of a wall on this border with Haiti. Our correspondent in that nation, Daisy Toussaint, tells us the details. In the Dominican Republic, the construction of a wall called the Intelligent Port of Defense the Dominican Republic and Haiti has formally begun. We are committed to the construction of an intelligent border fence, a fence that will benefit both countries because it will allow for a much more efficient control of bilateral trade, regulating migratory flows to combat the mafias that traffic with people and deal with drug trafficking and illegal arms sale. There are 392 kilometers of borders between countries, but there are only four official border crossings. Elias Piña, Himani, Perdenales, and Dajabón. Most of them do not have dividing fences. In February 2021, the Dominican president announced the construction of the wall. We will start building on the dividing line between the two countries, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. New security reinforcement measures that will combine physical and technological means, such as movement sensors, recognition cameras, and infrared systems. The project presented integrates a physical fence with lighting system, and center, motion control, and sensors, video surveillance cameras with infrared systems, as well as the infrastructure along the borderline. The policy of building a, a wall on the dominican haitian border by the government of President Abinader is more than a political mistake. It is an economical mistake and a social mistake. Both at the international level, the wall policy has been widely discussed, disputed, and discredited. On the economic level, 
Let us re remember that Haiti is the first commercial partner of the Dominican Republic, and any policy that does not be on good neighborliness, not only between states but also between peoples, will be an attack, an aggression to the coexistence, a development that precedes any prosperity and economic development. In 2019, under the previous government's administration, the construction of a 2,000 meter long fence started in Puerto but it was destroyed due to the overflowing of a river after the passage of Storm Laura in 2020. President Luis Abinander justified the building of the wall to stop irregular migration from Haiti. Some applaud this decision, and others understand that this wall not only a physical construction, but that it builds rejection, intolerance, and exclusion. Para Telesur, Daisy Tuzen, República Dominicana. Thank you, Daisy, for this story, and now we continue to other topics. This Friday, a food sovereignty bill was introduced to the Cuban National Assembly. The bill emphasizes on the key role of to be played by local agricultural producers. The initiative aims at increasing agricultural production and thus reducing the country's reliance on imports, which currently amounts to $1 billion a year. The bill drafts new work structures and addresses such issues as food safety, foreign affairs communication, and nutritional education and agroecology, among others. According to authorities from the Cuban Ministry of Agriculture, the bill seeks to guarantee food and nutritional security for the country's population of over 11 million inhabitants. It comes to encompass to be the general rule that allows to place all these functions that the Ministry of Agriculture has to achieve food sovereignty, food and nutritional security, and to guarantee the right to food. Now we move on to other topics. In Australia, at least five people have been killed by heavy rain and floods in the east of the country in recent days. Regional authorities reported on Saturday. Emergency services replied to more than 1,800 calls for help in 24 hours in southeast Queensland, officials reported. More than 250 people were in evacuation centers on Saturday morning. At the same time, Queensland State Police announced that they had found the body of a 37-year-old woman, bringing the number of people killed by the rains flooded rivers to five. Meanwhile, the governor of Queensland, Anastasia Palaskus, warned that the Murray River could rise up to 21 meters in Gympie. It could surpass levels last seen there in February 1999, the meteorological office reported. In Argentina, authorities were able to contain and reduce wildfires in the province of Corrientes, 70 percent, in part thanks to recent rainfall. However, at least four fires Main active. According to the Emergency Operations Command, among the areas that still have active fires are Palmar Grande, Loma Linda, Paraje Zapayo, and part of San Miguel. Bruno Lovinson, Deputy Director of Civil Defense, said they have the operational capacity and the qualified personnel to continue with the far fighting effort, and that they estimate to have control all fires within the next 48 hours. According to Argentina's National Institute of Technology, the flames have devastated nearly 1 million hectares already. In Peru, communities on the coast and the Amazon jungle have asked the United Nations for support to provide justice in the face of the ecological damage caused by oil spills, a problem that has affected them directly for decades. Representatives of native communities from the jungle and the north coast in Peru sent a letter to United Nations reported of toxic substances and human rights, Marco Orellana, relating their experiences, requests, and the lamentations. Orellana is in Peru on an academic visit. In their letter, they demand liability not just from the companies involved, but from their country governments. They roughly claim that the spills in the area destroyed the fisheries for decades, depriving them of their source of income and making their people sick. They told him of the importance of conveying their message to the Peruvian president, Pedro Castillo, and to the international community. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us.
Welcome back. Thousands of Shiites from across Iraq gathered in Baghdad on Saturday to mark the death of 8th century Imam Musa al Qadim. Pilgrims traveling to the holy shrine of Imam Musa al Qadim traditionally trek by foot to the twin domed mosque in Kazimiyah. The pilgrims are commemorating Imam Musa al Qadim, the seventh holy imam for the Shiite worshippers, who died in 799 AD. He buried in a mosque in the northern Baghdad neighborhood. Kazimiyah, a mainly Shiite area. For such a large event, the Iraqi forces have tightened security measures. The security forces have blocked most of the surrounding roads in fear of attacks against pilgrims and adopted wide scale deployment in the area. Insurgents have previously staged attacks on Shiite during this religious occasion. There are millions of people heading toward the holy city and your brothers in the security forces and other service departments are staying up day and night in order to provide security and protection for these pilgrims. Now we move on to other topics. Cape Town Pride Festival returned after a two-year hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Unlike other post-lockdown events in South Africa, the Pride Festival was open to people who haven't been vaccinated against coronavirus. About 2,000 people held the event and began at 12 local time, with various streets throughout the CBD closed due to the event. Saturday's walk and entertainment were preceded by a series of socials such as a roller skating night, hikes, a poetry evening, and the film festival. In March, celebrations will continue with pride from proms from a night of musical enjoyment with the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. The last pride parade was held in 2020, just before the COVID-19 lockdown, which left people isolated and in many cases losing their jobs and income. For the past three years, Brazil's far-right president Jair Bolsonaro has continually spread fake news about a small city in Sao Paulo called Araquara. We sent our correspondent Brian Mir there to find out why. Donald Trump singled out the city of Chicago, constantly using it as an example of everything he thought was bad. Since taking the Brazilian presidency, Jair Bolsonaro has done exactly the same thing with a city in Sao Paulo called Araraquara. Our city government is an antagonist to Bolsonaro. We are against his anti-vaccine policies of death. We believe in saving lives and supporting science, something that he's also against. This is why he constantly attacks this government, which is on the side of science, vaccine and life, and strengthening the public health system, which is something he wants to destroy. When Araraquara became the first city in Brazil to fully adopt WHO lockdown guidelines for COVID-19, President Bolsonaro announced the population was starving to death and sent the army in to distribute food. Last week, he returned to the subject, falsely claiming that hungry people in Araraquara are eating cats and dogs. We are victims of fake news because during this entire pandemic, we have implemented an adequate food security policy. We have been delivering food to vulnerable families the whole time. It's not just the fact that the Araraquara government contradicts government COVID-19 guidelines that bothers President Bolsonaro. What really seems to bother him is the fact that 95% of the population has ignored his advice and taken at least one dose of the vaccine. We show people the numbers of people who have gotten sick and died without taking the vaccine. Our health department uses the strategy of convincing people by showing the numbers and the reality of how important it is to follow science. Brian Mir, tell us, sir. Thank you, Ryan, for the report. Now we move on. A Chinese health official said at a press briefing on Saturday that Beijing will continue to support Hong Kong amid a recent COVID-19 surge. 
He also said that the central government will work closely with their Hong Kong counterparts to fight against the pandemic. Hong Kong on Friday reported a sharp jump in new COVID-19 cases to more than 10,000 in the latest 24-hour period, as it battles its worst outbreak of the pandemic. The city has been reporting about 50 fatalities a day, many among the vaccinated elderly. Under China's zero approach, mass testing and tight regional restrictions are still enforced for a short period of time as soon as a few cases are detected. In addition, other COVID-19 epidemiologists will communicate with the team eating in Hong Kong every day by video link to advise on the work in Hong Kong. The pandemic in Hong Kong is currently at a stage of rapid spread and accelerated rise. The central government will continue to fully support the prevention and control of the pandemic in Hong Kong, and mainland experts will continue to work closely with their Hong Kong counterparts to fight against the pandemic. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.